the Society of New York in 1894, with tolerance and religious universalism as its guiding principles. In the four years that he was away in both America and Europe, Vivekananda built up a large following. Some of his foreign disciples decided to give up everything they had and join him in his work in India. Notable among them were Margaret Noble, later Sister Nivedita, who devoted herself to women's education in India. J.J. Goodwin, Sister Christine, Josephine MacLeod, Captain and Mrs. Sevier. In 1897, enriched by his four years of travel in the West, the Swami felt the immediate task before him was to work for India's regeneration from within the country. He had come to America unknown and unsure of his position. He now returned to his homeland as a hero and as its most important advocate of Vedam. Shortly before he came back to his country, Vivekananda had said, now I have but one thought, and that is India. It was a triumphant return for the beggar sannyasi. In Madras, where he first landed, and later in Calcutta at the Show Bazaar Palace, he was given a rousing reception. Unprecedented crowds collected to greet him and welcome him home. But for Vivekananda, this was the beginning of the practical implementation of his life's work. Away from the public gaze, there was a quieter reunion with his brother monks. Together they moved the monastery across the river to a garden house at Belur. He spent hours meditating in his room overlooking the water. With a clear view of Baranagar, where he last saw Ramakrishna, and of Dokhineshwar, where almost a decade earlier he had met the master who changed his life. It was in an adjoining area on the banks of the river that he formally consecrated Belur Mott in 1898. A few months after his return, he decided to establish the Ramakrishna mission, distinct from the monastery at Belur, but interrelated. It would be based on the non-sectarian teachings of the Vedanta and would emphasize humanitarian services, education and social work. 
the institutional framework was thus established for the worship of God through the service of man. I consider, he said, that the great national sin is the neglect of the masses and that this is one of the causes of our downfall. If we want to regenerate India, we must work for them. The education of women was also one of Vekananda's primary concerns. And within a year after his return, the Nivedita Girls' School was started. Vivekananda also outlined his idea of a monastery exclusively for women. His idea has taken full shape in the Sharda Mot, only a few hundred yards from Dokineshwar. Run and managed entirely by women monks, the Sharda Monastery continues to attract women from all over India and the world to work for women's education, training and health with centers all over the country. And fired by his goal of India's regeneration, Vivekananda set up institution after institution to improve both material and spiritual life in the country. Those modest beginnings have grown into an enormous network of spiritual and humanitarian services all over the nation, from hospitals to schools for girls and boys, to institutions for the disabled, orphanages, and cultural centers. And of course, the 99 Ramakrishna monasteries and missions in India and 33 in different parts of the world, from America and Europe to Russia and Japan. All of them based on the essence of Vedanta, the oneness of all being. It was here, in his favorite room, that he spent most of his time during his last years. Throughout his life, music and writing had been a passion with Vivekananda. And at Belur, in this corner of the room overlooking the river, he continued his work, writing about his intense love of India. Despite a second trip to the West, it was his work in India that remained his passion in these years. On his return to Madras in 1897, he declared, for the next 50 years, this alone shall be our keynote, this our great mother India. Now back in Belur, writing his most important essays on national problems, he wanted everyone to proclaim with him, the soil of India is my highest heaven. He had often blamed the educated but parasitical upper classes for the nation's decline. Now he wrote, forget not that the lower classes, the ignorant, the poor, the illiterate, the cobbler, the sweeper, are your flesh and blood your brothers. About his works, Mahatma Gandhi wrote, after having gone through them, the love I had for my country became a thousandfold. Subhash Chandra Bose called Vivekananda the spiritual father of the modern nationalist movement. Nehru described him 
as one of the great founders of the modern national movement of India. Sri Aurobindo saw in his work the awakening soul of the nation. And Tagore said, read Vivekananda if you want to know India. But Vivekananda's health was failing and he didn't live long after his ideas were put into effect. Now even traveling in India, which had so sustained him in the past, was becoming tiring and difficult. Even so, in 1902, he made the journey to Varanasi. It was to be the last time that he returned to this, the seat of Shiva, on the banks of the Ganga. Returning to Belur, he spent more and more time in his room, meditating, writing, meeting his brother monks. On the 4th of July, 1902, Swamiji went to the chapel in the morning. He prayed for three hours and then sang a song about Kali. The whole day he seemed to be in high spirits. In the afternoon he went for a long walk on the banks of the river. And when it was dark, he spent some time in solitary meditation in his room. Then he asked for all the windows to be opened and lay down in silence. At around nine o'clock, he passed away, entering into what his brother monks and disciples called Mahasamadhi. What did he merge into? Perhaps there's a glimpse of an answer in a song he composed. Oh uh -huh. 